Gary, it's great to have you on the show. And I know that you are joining me in this conversation from uh, what, south of London, somewhere in south, yeah, south coast part of the, the, the UK. The is about a mile that way. There you go. So um, we could certainly spend a lot of time talking about great restaurants and wonderful places to visit in your wonderful country. But really, to today is really about something else. It's more about your background your understanding of, of all of these technological changes that are affecting us, uh, certainly with AI. And it seems to be the big topic these days because it's so transformative, it's so disruptive. So I wanna start with one question and start at the organizational level of a company, a nonprofit, for-profit, what have you. And I noticed it, and you probably have too, that we often find that organizations solve problems thinking that they're problems and they're really more uh, symptoms that we, really just sort of chasing the same issue over and over again because we really haven't gotten to root cause. And, and it causes a, another downstream issue regarding you know, solving issues in silos and there's a, a lack of alignment to our, our solutions. So I guess my question to start with you is, is there, do you have a sense about how AI and how technology is helping us become better at solving the real problem versus the symptom of that problem. What's your sense? Very good question. Uh, and I can, I can, I guess I can, I can start. These are with... un, these are unprepared. Yeah, questions. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just throwing lobs at you, man. I know yeah. that you were not prepared for some of this, but let's just see where we go with it. Yeah, no, 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 it's it's great. Uh, you know, I guess we can start with where I'm at right now. And we can go back to some earlier things and think forward about what you know what comes next. Uh, but you know, I uh, I got into AI when I was like ten years old, um, and I began in the industry uh, in like 1999. Uh, so I've been in in AI for like 25 years. So so I've I've seen quite a few phases of of hype and excitement around AI, uh, many full stories, and I have spent two decades wrestling with really unintelligent machines, uh, trying to get them to behave as if they're intelligent. And, and through that process, we've deployed those horrible, you know, those, they're called IVR systems when you call a contact center and you have to press buttons or speak to a system that doesn't understand you. It's been hard yards and, and, and we could create good systems there, but uh, it took a lot of work, a lot of like careful scripting and, and no one could realistically afford the effort to, to do that, to, to, to make these systems human-like and, and, and give them the semblance of smarts. That has changed, and we can talk about how that's changed and what that means, but, but that's kind of the, the background. But, but, but I got into Contact Center because that was the only place where AI was really being monetized, speech recognition and things like that. Um, over all this time, I've, I've learned something about Contact Center, and then I think we can step back and see what it means about our businesses. But people think of contact centers, a lot of people think about contact centers uh, customer service centers as a way to engage customers and create lovely experiences. And I think it's totally wrong. Like people don't call or text or chat online with companies because they want to. They do it because they have to, because something went wrong. Um, so I think, you know, in our area, I think people have seen contact centers as an opportunity to deliver great customer experience when really they should be seen as bug reporting systems. Something went wrong, um, and we need to go back and see why didn't that order get delivered? So that customer had to call and, and complain. Or why did we deliver the red item and not the green item? Um, so I think this is an example in, in contact center and customer service and customer experience, which I've been in for 20 years, where the, the symptom is that people call you and people thought, great, this is an opportunity to please them. But the reality was the reason they called or chatted is because something went wrong, because your business was broken. And you should go fix your business rather than get really good at chatting to customers on, on a call. It's a fascinating idea. So you go back to these contact centers, as you call them. I think in the US, we're probably more familiar with you know, customer service centers or call yep. centers, as you might yep. call them. But you're right. It's, a, it's one of the most aggravating thing for me. I mean, I, I think I'm pretty emotionally intelligent, but the thing that drives me nuts more than anything is probably the lack of patience that I have when I call a content center or a customer service center to try to get something solved. 
and I'm being forced through a series of prompts. And tell me more about what you want. And I just want to talk to a live human being. And I keep going past all of these prompts. Just I want to talk to somebody. So have organizations sort of done themselves well, do, a do disservice? You, do you really want to talk to someone? Do I really you really do. want to talk to someone at your bank because they failed to make your payment? Or do you prefer it if they just made your payment in the first place? Well, I would just prefer them that I didn't have to call them in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, if you could solve for that, I wouldn't be calling you at all. This is already an irritant just to have to get on the phone to call somebody. Percent. But once I have to call them because whatever, there's a bad charge on my credit card or whatever, or I, I want to do something, you know, with my account that, you know, is a problem. I want to talk to a human being. That's me. And I, and I don't know if it's a generational thing because of my age and, and, I'm, and I'm used to and I grew up in a world of personal contact was sort of the way in which we were trained. And, and maybe the younger generation is so much more familiar with solving problems through apps and solving problems through prompts and so forth. But, you know, so what's your sense about that? Is it, are we doing a disservice in some ways by these customer service centers making it difficult to get to a point where we can talk to a human being? Or is it, in fact, adding a better experience for people? It's definitely like, unless you're running a concierge service, uh, which is all about engaging people and helping them, then uh, no, like cu customer service centers, like they're not about giving a great customer experience. It should be about reducing the pain as much as possible for the thing that just went wrong. And I would argue that, you know, you say you prefer speaking to a human being, but like you prefer it didn't happen in the first place. The next thing, if it happened, you'd like a really quick and easy way to let someone know that something's gone wrong and get it fixed. Correct. You don't have to use a human to do that. Uh, now, you've got used to relying on humans to do that because, you know, and me too, um, because I guess we grew up in an area you know, maybe a little bit before digital. And so we didn't have... I mean, my first phone, it definitely wasn't very smart. Um, so, so the only way to get stuff done was to walk into a store, was to, to pick up the telephone. So that, that's the way we've been used to doing it. Um, and over time, time, that experience has got worse because, because the uh, volume and complexity of services has gone up so much that the number of ways that they can go wrong has gone up so much that, that, that the number of times you need to kind of call a company and get it fixed uh, is much more than it, it would have been in the past. I mean, in the past, let's face it, you would have got you loaf of bread from the baker along the road. And, and if it was at stale, you, you would have kind of just given it back to him the next day and it would have said, very sorry, Dean, here's two for free. But now, because we're not shopping local in the same way and, and we're relying on global organizations, it's much harder for them to give that, that really kind of personal service. So, so I guess winding back, you just want your problem solved. You, you've lived through the era that I worked through in terms of trying to create customer service center automation systems that actually work really it was it was <laughs> if i'm really honest it was a waste of time because because it was a waste of time a lot of us have spent a lot of time trying to create systems to to help customers but the technology just wasn't good enough it wasn't smart we were trying to rely on our customers to navigate these complex menus and get to the right place um, create those systems in a way that was actually easy and comfortable for customers to use was, was just prohibitively expensive. And, and really, I think we should have accepted that earlier on and gone back to the symptom. Okay, we can't get enough human beings to answer all these calls. So instead of trying to get robots to answer the calls, let's try and reduce the number of calls. And uh, you know, about a decade ago, the, um, Bill Price, he was... The, Amazon's first SVP of customer service. He wrote this book, The Best Service is No Service. And he taught us to look at every contact and consider it from the perspective of the business and from the consumer. And if it was irritable to either of them, you should either eliminate it, simplify it so no one minds, or automate it. And if it's beneficial to both of us, we should leverage it. That's a conversation we want to have. Um, but, but the problem was that finding out, you know, understanding all those different contacts you're getting, and the quality of conversations, which are irritating, which are beneficial, that's really hard. You've got to listen to a, a lot of conversations. And that's expensive. 
and, and so people didn't do it enough. And, and so they kept on just trying to add more agents or add more automation rather than really delve into the source of the contact and see what, what see it as a symptom, as you put right at the beginning of this discussion, um, and go look for the root cause and solve that, eliminate it, simplify it, or automate it. I love the idea and I love this. I'm going to have to go get this book. The best service is no service. I think that's just a very profound statement. Knowing that it's very expensive to put people into conversations with customers and yet you want to reduce errors as much as possible. I'm thinking now like Six Sigma and the manufacturing process. You know, if we put that into our into just about any company and reduce error rates would, it, of course, reduce problems for customers who would have to call you in the first place. So. I can I understand that, but how then do you then, in a growing, iterative learning company, with changes that are happening in the market, be able to understand what the customer experience is, so that you can improve your internal processes and systems in a way that's affordable, in yeah. a way that's not cumbersome for the client, i.e., the customer. And and there's been lots of solutions proposed and deployed and built and sold over the last couple of decades, none of which have really moved the needle very much. Uh, but in the last 18 months or so, we've had ChatGPT and me and my team have dived really, really deep into the capabilities of the new Gen AI, uh, generative uh, AI uh, technologies. And we think finally we have the answer to really solve for the sickness in the contact center and we call it the ai first contact center so so the idea here is that every contact rather than trying to find a human being who doesn't particularly want that job and training them for two weeks and then putting them on the phone and, and then hoping they're going to have a conversation instead of doing that you try to train generative ai agents to have those discussions so like, like versions of ChatGPT that are specialized to interact with your customers on the issues that your customers have. So you start, you, you don't start there, but that's where you're going to try and get. So we want to have AI on the front line, escalating to agents and getting help if they need it. Because uh, the advantage of, of AI is that we train it once. The, the problem contact centers have is that people don't really like the job very much. It's not a nice job. You've got hundreds of turnover is high uh, yeah the churn is like on average 29 percent, i think in north america but we've got customers who experience 67 percent churn a year so so you've got you've got uh jobs that people don't really like um that aren't particularly well paid uh where they don't stay very long and so you're trying to train these junior human intelligences to interact with your customers well um and you only get so far and then they go but with Gen AI, we can train it and, and get it deployed where it's at or, or even a little bit above the capability of a human agent on a specific task. And then we can iterate and optimize. We can look at every conversation that agent has. We can evaluate was it effective or not. And then we can feed that into our optimization program, some of which could be automatically done with, with modern generative AI because Gen AI can analyze the conversations that you're Gen AI agents just had, and it can then evaluate were they good or bad conversations. Where they're good conversations, we can use it to fine tune the AI models and make them even better. Where they're bad conversations, we can use them as counterexamples. We can have humans come in and say, oh, yeah, no, no, that's not how we do that process and, and, and update the instructions that we're given the chatbot. Or that would have worked, but but the API failed. So let's go fix the API. So 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 the idea here is that is that in an AI first contact center, we have customers interacting with AI agents. We have other AI agents analyzing those conversations for quality. We have other AI agents uh, coming up with ways that we might improve the instructions that the customer facing agents have. We deploy them, we get more conversations, and this cycle continues. And we call it automated automation. And what happens when you do this, and it's early days, like we're just deploying systems like that. Uh, but what, what, what we're what starting to see, I think what we expect to see is to start with, you'll, you'll begin with a couple of small use cases that Gen AI is capable of. They will be as good and then gradually get better and better and better compared to junior agents. And then you'll move on to the next use cases. 
But ultimately, because generative agents don't churn like human agents do, you can continuously raise the bar of performance. And because you're analyzing every single chat or call, you can see, was this a conversation that was productive and beneficial to the business and to the customer? Great, let's carry on having those conversations. Or was it one that's irritating to other business or the customer? In which case, that's a bug report. Let's go back and look at how we can fix that. And so turning into inwards with the company, say you've described um, these customer service centers, these content centers as you described them, from a perspective of uh, the interaction between the company and the customer. Let's look inside now, inside the box, inside the company. Are there certain tools that if I'm a leader of a team, my goal is to make my team more productive? That's my problem to solve. I can do the things I've been doing for years and I've been trained to do in you know, my MBA student background, what have you. But now I'm thinking about how can AI, how can generative AI maybe make my team more productive? I don't mean like productive in terms of manufacturing and widgets and so forth and robotic ways of doing things. I just mean in terms of the the workflow and of making all of us more efficient and cutting out waste, cutting out time that is not necessary. Are there t- certain types of tools that you know of? And if so, what are they? GPT, Google, yes, Gemini, of yeah. <laughs> Anthropics, Claude. If you want to use a uh, an open source model, use Llama. Uh, they they recently launched uh, new models with more than 400 billion parameters. So any of us, either for free or maybe $20 a month, can have access to a really powerful AI model. So what is Llama? You go back to that. You just mentioned it. Particular tool that I've not heard of before. Go into that. Uh, a it's just bit. so. So in the same way that we've got ChatGPT and we've got Gemini from Google and we've got uh, Claude from Anthropic, Llama is Meta, Facebook's um, uh, AI model. I got it. So it's similar it's to ChatGPT. It's, it's open source. If you want to, you can download it and run it on your own machine or run it in your own data center. Um, so very interesting for companies that are very very um, uh, sort of conscious about security and want to air gap their systems and things like that. Or for so, hackers and developers who just want to play with open source models. So I think you're, you're other... asking me um, how, like, how, like, look inwards within a company. How do we start to leverage AI? Right. And and I think uh, a couple of things. Use it. Like every person in your organization should be mandated to use one of the AI models. And you know they all provide ways to have corporate accounts so that, so that you can manage usage and, and make sure that, that they're not going to train on your data and things like that. Every single knowledge worker should have ChatGPT open on their desk or their, or their other favorite AI, open on their desk every single day. And if you're not using it every single day, you are, that's a dereliction of duty for any knowledge worker. If you're using it every hour, probably where I'm at at the moment, you're in a good spot. I mean, some hours, I was like, like you know, preparing for this podcast. I threw in a bit of information from your last uh, conversation, threw in a few ideas I had, said, let's role play it. I switched to, to audio, switched my iPhone. I've been wandering around the house for the last 30 minutes having this discussion. Right? So, so, um, so, so use it and, and be conscious about making sure, like give yourself or your teams quotas about how much they should use it. Go check. Like, how much usage are you getting? Because, because I think this is the key. And winding back, um, I warn you, we have to kind of go between the kind of the technical and the practical and the philosophy here, because I think it's really important uh, to to understand really what we've got here. Um, we've not had what I would call real artificial intelligence up until now. We might have called it artificial intelligence, but it didn't have the same kind of character as human intelligence. I think for the first time with generative AI, with the power of the models we've got now, we're starting to see artificial intelligence that has some of the character of human intelligence. Um, interestingly, if, if you look at the latest models, the latest models probably around one to two billion parameters. That's all of the, the weights in the model that, that it learned from reading the whole internet. That's what helps it uh, respond when you put, put input into a model. It's all those parameters. 
That's the equivalent of about one or two square millimeters of the neocortex on the the brain of, of a human. You know, the neocortex is essentially what, what makes mammals different from other animals, and it's what makes humans uh, so much more intelligent than other mammals. That's kind of really convincing intelligence. Um, and uh, our models are now <laughs> represent like one or two millimeters of, of that in terms of the number of weights compared to the number of, of connections we have in our brain. So we're starting to create systems that have got a tiny bit of the complexity and potential that, that important parts of the human brain have. Um, but they've learned very differently. You and I didn't read the whole internet, but we're still much more intelligent than ChatGPT, much more practically intelligent than ChatGPT. So, so I just tell this to kind of give, give a bit of a, uh, of a mindset, kind of an intuition to your, to your uh, audience um, that we're starting to get real intelligence, but it hasn't learned like humans learned. So it's like having really, really, really well-read school kid come and, you know, come, come into your team as an intern. And they know almost everything, but they have no common sense, no practical sense of what's right or wrong. They know nothing about your business. They know nothing about how to work. They're brilliant at coding. They know quantum physics and Chinese and French and Spanish and, and psychology. But none of those things that allow us humans to navigate this world comfortably and, 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 and do the right thing most of the time. Um, so that's what we've got here. And, and the key to using it is to use it. I think the second key to using it is to spend a lot of time using it on subjects you know well, because then you will spot where it gets things right and wrong. Don't just shoot at a question and get the answer. Have a conversation. It really really benefits from that cycle of back and forth between you and the model. Um, and, and through that process of using it every day or every hour in subjects that interest you or that you know about, you will start to form an intuition about the nature of this digital intelligence. And then you can start understanding how to apply it as an individual and as a business. And for it's me, what does that mean? I use it to to just shoot the breeze about like what might we discuss with Dean Newland. I use it to shoot the breeze about you know the the seat of consciousness. I use it to explore the similarities and differences between Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, and uh, and who your last guest coach uh, J V who was talking about manifesting. Right. So I do those things just for fun. Yeah. Uh, but in my business work, I use it to write bits of code or transform data or analyze data. But there was a lot, but, but I think, you know, the most important thing is to recognize that this isn't just a tool like we've had before. It's actual intelligence. It's extremely, it has some similar, similar character to human intelligence. It has massive differences. And only you in your area of expertise can really explore and understand where they are and therefore have to harness it. So what I've got out of this so far, Kerry, a lot of things, but one of the things you just said that really struck with me is we just got to get to use it on a regular basis. And that through that usage, we're going to learn about what's possible. I know that with us, where I in particular, I do use ChatGPT or some sort of AI every day. Like even on a personal level, my wife and I were trying to figure out what we're going to do for our upcoming a European trip to Italy. And usually we sit down and we spend several nights on our computers sitting outside near our fireplace and start looking up stuff. I went, wait a minute, why don't we ask ChatGPT to give us an itinerary? Here's the cities we want to go. Find us some great restaurants, great places to go eat, good places to go and visit. And lo and behold, we have three different itineraries, one going to the north, one going through the south, and one going through Tuscany. And she comes back to me and she goes, what the hell? I mean, how did you do that? I said, well, I just involved, you know, generative AI to be able to help us with that. And in our little company, um, you know, with, with PowerPoint presentations, I, I found a way to, you know, you get so tired of those staged, old, repeatable, recognizable images that are used in your presentations. And I said, I found another AI app to be able to say, create an image of X, Y, and Z, and lo and behold, it does, you know, and it's gorgeous, it's beautiful, it's unique. And then there was another one we found where you could actually create a song. So I was in a facilitation with a group, and there was a particular phrase that came up 
enough times that during the break, I went back and I plugged it in and created a song around that phrase. Clients loved it because it's unique, it's fresh, it's real time. And of course, being able to compile and research data is, it's cut, I get to cut hundreds of hours off of our time in our company to do the work that we do. So I think your point's really well taken. So let me, let me go ahead. I, I can see in your face, you have a thought. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think you really nailed it there. You know, because what you're doing there is tasks you did before, but you're finding a way to do them much more quickly and efficiently using ChatGPT. And I, I was away on a cruise last week. And so whenever we turned up at a, at a port, you know, before we docked, I'd bring up ChatGPT with the family and we'd say, here we are, like, I'm here with my, uh, two, two uh, adolescent daughters and my wife and, and the grandparents and we're interested in exploring the area what can you suggest we've got three hours um, and it comes up with the whole itinerary and uh, awesome and, uh, and a couple of those were brilliant there's another one we went to it suggested we went up to this waterfall go around and we're not quite thought, sure where it is I took a photo of the street sign and go with that and it's like oh yeah no this way and then I kind of like let me just check this on Google Maps it didn't exist it made it up so so i think a great, a great example of how like it's so powerful and so convincing that 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 you can use it in so many different ways and, and i love your, your your example of of producing music i've done that like when when i've been to great parties i've taken my photos i've thrown it into the photos app in iphone i've got it to create a montage then i've gone on udo and uh and generated a song i've used chat gpt to come up with the lyrics and i've edited it all together and i've sent it to them on whatsapp as a two or three minute video and they are just like made up it took me 20 minutes and 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 a few different ai tools but look what are the characteristics of what we're talking about here are there things we know really well well about so we can uh we can spot when the ai model gets beyond its its sort of uh, uh edge of competence and starts making stuff up um, or we're talking about things where the stakes of the AI, AI model making a mistake are quite low so if the music isn't that good no harm done get it to regenerate and I think when we look back and, and there's some, some recent uh, research that I saw in terms of adoption of gen AI across different industries and it was looking at uh, who'd done pilots and who had put things into production it was really interesting is that there was a lot of pilots and not much production, but also across industries, it was very different. At the, at the bottom end of adoption, uh, you've got HR, legal, operations, IT. No wonder, because if you get something wrong in legal or in HR or in IT or in operations, really bad things happen, much worse than those lyrics in your song didn't weren't that good but when we actually look at like where we get much more traction it's marketing well that's easy because marketers make stuff up all the time the chatbot's not, not going not to do any worse than most marketers um you've got coding and that's because it's an environment where you well firstly there's loads of code examples on the internet for the models to learn from but also when you get it to code and you try and run the code, the compiler will pick up an error or your, your QA test will pick up an error. Um, if it gets something wrong, it gets caught very quickly and easily. And that's also the situation in the contact center. Um, because we're so used to managing intelligences, human intelligences, uh, that aren't that well trained in the job because they're just never there for long enough. And so we've got mechanisms to, to catch those issues. Just like, uh, developers and coding systems have developed ways to to catch bugs, um, and I think I think it was really interesting seeing that laid out because it kind of I think really brings statistics and evidence to the discussion we're having here, which is that you can use AI to support you as an individual in your work, in idea creation, in doing rote tasks like data analysis or converting this document into a summary it's great for all those things but you'll be able to see if it gets it wrong and the other places it's good is where it's operating in a, an environment that's constrained enough the mistakes get caught naturally and coding or contact center a great example but there are there not examples though where you have to be precise like i'm just thinking in the healthcare environment my wife just had her hip replaced and 
the woman who performed the surgery does five of these a day. And I figure she's got to have this down to a T. Everything is totally based on a process that gets repeated every time. And so she could practically do it in her sleep. I get that. But I'm also, so you wouldn't necessarily have AI involved with that because, you know, you, you have to make sure that it's always perfect. But on the other hand, I would think that in certain kinds of healthcare environments, this is just an example where I could see it, like when radiology, where if you're looking at somebody's chart or, you know, their lungs, the, the, the picture that gets generated, that you might have some sort of AI function to be able to read what is being seen on the chart much faster than a human being could, but probably less errors than a human being could because they're yeah, sitting yeah. Oh, in no, these dark like, rooms for 10 AI, hours a day. AI is better at spotting breast cancer than any human. There you go. And what's interesting, this is really interesting because a lot of people are like, we're nervous about deploying AI. So let's deploy it with human supervision because that way, you know, we don't have to worry about it so much. AI is better at detecting breast cancers than human radiologists. Human radiologists using breast cancer, uh, sorry, using AI, are worse than AI alone in detecting breast cancers. And the very worst is just doctors on their own. So go back to that. That's a very interesting statistic you just mentioned, that it's worse when there is the human being involved overseeing AI. Why are the stats lower? that way because you would think almost that it would be opposite it seems to go against our intuition on that yeah and and look, i'm not deep into that particular area of research uh, but i think you know my my intuition here and 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 is that humans like and we can get onto some really interesting areas when we get to agi and super intelligence which we should touch on here right but i think one of the issues is that when you know a contact center agent is trying to answer a question or a a radiologist is trying to interpret a scan. They, they're human. They have their own prejudices. They have their own emotional cycle. They have their own energy cycle. They can be distracted. There, there are so many things that can stop us focusing on the task and doing it as well now as we did five minutes ago or as well as we might do it in 10 minutes. Um, and so I think just the inherent human variability uh, when, <laughs> when put on top of the AI doesn't, on average, make it better. I think there, I think there, there, there are some senses in which we can overcome that by using AI to, to triage. So, so you know, and this happens in medicine and it happens in contact centers. So, in medicine, I think a lot now they're using AI to triage uh, the uh, the radiology images to prioritize which should the doctors look at first because the cancer is most advanced or the cancer is most treatable. Awesome. So, you, so, so, so you're not relying on the prediction of the, the AI to, to be right or wrong. You're just relying on it to point the human beings where uh, their, their, their particular brand of intelligence is needed most. Um, and just... that's, like, that's exactly what we do in the contact center. So especially in an AI first contact center, so you have AI interact with, with, with the customers first and triage. Is this a question I can answer? Okay. Here's your answer. Is this something that I can, that I've got access to APIs and I can do? Great, I'll help you do that. Am I struggling to understand this person? Are they getting frustrated? Let me put you through to someone else. And, and, and most of what we do in building an AI first contact center is, is really train and teach the, the AI to know what it's good at and know when to stop. And so we'll guardrail it. We'll, we'll say, you must not say any of these things. Or if you're talking about these things, you must put it this way. And, and we'll have one AI model watching the other AI model and checking, did it say anything it shouldn't have said? Did it say it in the right way? And so, and so that's, that's really how, 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 how we do this. And I think, I think this is where another intuition comes in. This is intelligence. How do we run businesses today? We run them with dumb computers and intelligent humans and an organization that lets them all work together. But now we've got something else. We've got dumb computers, intelligent humans, and intelligent silicon species, or whatever you want to call them, intelligent uh, generative AI, a kind of intelligent. So we've got, we've got a new source of productivity in businesses. And our job, just like we had to learn how to organize humans, and then how to organize IT, and then how to organize IT and humans so they could work together and create nice user interfaces and 
compliance procedures and security and sound guards and all those things. We've got to do that same process now with AI. And I think, I think the important thing for managers and leaders to realize is that your mental model should not be computing. Your mental model should be hiring humans and organizing humans in your, uh, in your businesses, your organizations, or, or your life. That's a fascinating comment that you just sort of made. I'm sort of writing some notes down here, Kerry, but I've never thought about it that way, that a leader within an organization now has obviously organizing and motivating humans, working with kind of dumb computers, and then accessing this other form of intelligence. And so almost like there's a new role that has just been introduced into to that of leader or, or a member of a team is you had two, now you've got three. And an AI is that you third have two. one. Now you have three hundred. Yeah, we think. Yeah, exactly. It's a fascinating. So let me. And, let me and we've been through this process before. Outsourcing. Go ahead. We've been How through so? this process for outsourcing. So in the contact center, there's a lot of outsourcing of uh, contact center and customer service uh, agent roles uh, to to lower cost jurisdictions. Uh, we've seen the same in software development, and that requires whole new ways of thinking about how I structure a team, train a team, manage a team, lead a team. Um, we had to worry about new cultural and language differences. And I think in a way you can think about some of the challenges we have of interacting with AI is a cultural and language issue. A lot of the reasons that AI hallucinates, that's when AI makes something up. There's a lot, a lot of kind of the debate about is AI ready for, for prime time? It doesn't always get things right. Um, a lot of the reasons it gets things right, uh, sorry, wrong, is because, just going back a little bit here, the way Gen AI actually works is it's just autocomplete. It's just, it's just taking a sentence and Say it again. autocomplete. It takes auto-complete. an input, okay. like a sentence, and just like your word processor or your, or your iPhone will predict what's the next word so you don't have to write it all out, that's what a generative language model is doing. But, but we trained this model on so much data and made it so big that it was really, really, really good at predicting the most likely word. And so like a couple of years ago, what that meant is it could make up fun stories. You could put in once upon a time, it would say there was a bear in the woods or, or whatever. And, and, it, and that was like, wow, that was cool. But it wasn't useful. What made ChatGPT useful, the big, the big change was essentially an army of human reviewers uh, putting in questions, getting the answers, and then rating those answers. And when they rated the answers low, give an example of what would have been better. So we basically taught the model. Basically, it learned the whole of human language and quite a lot of knowledge from reading the internet and predicting what would be the next word. And then, and then with all that inherent knowledge inside the model, we molded it, we what's called aligned it with what we wanted from it. And what we focused on was when we ask you a question, we want an answer. And literally, thousands of human reviewers, tens of millions of examples, we were, we were whipping this AI into submission. If we ask you a question, you've got to give us an answer. If we ask you a question, you've got to give us an answer. So when you ask it a question, it feels like it has to give you an answer. But if you ask it a question that it doesn't have the knowledge for, or that's subjective, it will make it up. Because it's been trained that you always answer a human being. And it's really interesting. <laughs> you can do this. Like if you, if you ask certain subjective questions to ChatGPT, you'll get a bad answer. If you say, if you don't know, that's okay. You'll say, I don't know. So you, you can actually out. add, you can even, you can instruct ChatGPT or a similar process to answer, I don't know. Yes. And it would answer, I don't know, if it had a subjective it would be question much come less to it. To hallucinate oh, I've never thought about that before. Because I bought but now because I get this, stuff all the time and I go like, where this. did you come up with that? This is this is cultural. There are I've worked with many outsourced uh, contact centers and, and software development firms and and culture is really important. There are some cultures where you'll ask a question and because I'm senior and I'm asking it of a junior programmer. The answer will always be yes, because culturally they can't say no to a manager, even if they know the answer is wrong. It's just a cultural divide. So once I understand how to work with them, give me out. Oh, I really want to understand this. So you start getting better results from them. I can't help but see 
the relationship between that and, and, and the way we interact with AI models. So, Carrie, I got a couple more questions I want to ask you, to, just shifting gears a little bit. Is the model, is the ChatGPT intelligence biased? Or does it have, in some cases, uh, will it limit the answer because of something sensitive? I, like, for example, my son is involved in this relationship with this delightful gal, and, and she has a, a, a daughter from a previous relationship, and she's Hispanic, and she's probably, I don't know, six or seven. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to make a birthday card using a variation of ChatGPT and uh, being able to des design an image. And so when I started to write down the prompt for it to do that, it blocked me from doing it because one, it was Hispanic, I believe, and two, it was a child. And so it said, we can't do this. So then it opened up my mind to thinking like, there's still human beings making decisions about this algorithm. How much so? Is this doing, truly like, open source or are we being, you know, we can get into a, we need two more podcast episodes, my friend, but is there a direction? Is there a philosophy? Is there a point of view that is being presented to us by humans that get incorporated into algorithms that we think is just the answer, but in fact, it's the it's being uh, manipulated by certain algorithmic decisions that humans make. 100%. So let's go back to how, how it worked. ChatGPT learned from the whole internet. Well, it wasn't ChatGPT. GPT-3 learned from the whole internet. Um, and it was fun, but useless. To make it useful, we had to bias it. Now, it was already biased because it read the internet. And there's some really old and objectionable points of view on the internet, right? So it was already biased by what humans had already written on the internet. Then we had to rebias it to make it answer questions rather than just predict the next word. And that was great. It would answer questions. But people would ask it, how do I make a nuclear bomb? And it would answer. How do I modify COVID virus and make it more transmissible and more deadly? And it would answer. It's like, all right, we can't put these out there. So then they got these humans to review uh, the responses and, and teach the model not to answer those kind of questions. You know, we made some value judgments. We want these things to be useful, but we don't want them to be useful to, to bad actors. And that all sounds great. The challenge we have, and, and, and firstly, like, this isn't a bad thing. The reasons the models become useful, the reason ChatGPT got 100 million subscribers in like a week and a half, um, and GPT-3 didn't, is through bias, through that alignment, uh, through getting it to answer questions rather than just project the next sentence, and through, and, and then realizing that it was saying things that we might, you know, might embarrass open AI and then, and then bias it further so it wouldn't talk about those bad subjects. This is all good. This is good bias. The problem we have, though, and this is like this whole field of, of alignment. How do we align the models with human beings? You know what, Dean? The problem we have is that human beings are not aligned. And so that's the problem you're getting there, I think, is that, is that someone in a Silicon Valley company somewhere said, we're going to get in trouble if we allow people to produce um, sort of racially motivated images, so we're going to ban it. They weren't thinking that Dean uh, might have a very reasonable reason to generate a particular racially sort of uh, focused image because it was a birthday of his son's girlfriend. I mean, and, and I think this is where it's, it's sorry. Yeah, no, it, it's a great point. So then you extrapolate that to say, we have, who are these people making these moral decisions for millions of people when it comes to what you can and cannot see and the answers that you are able to access via uh, generative AI? It's like, who are these? Well, is, is, the it... people, is the people we pay for the models? It's open AI. It's Google. Um, and they're, but, and they're but, trying but, to but do, do you, what they but, think their customers want. They're, they're commercial if, companies. They're not doing this. Well, okay. I'm sure there's some political influence, and then, well, oh, that's I'm what sure I'm wondering. Like, like, like if, if if like Donald Trump can be kicked off of Twitter, yeah. Because, but this is that, right, and this is where we're getting into. Like, and I think we should just touch on a few of these things just to whet your your audience appetite. So let's try and cut cover off a few of the like, where are we going, and what does that mean? So, so 
firstly on this, so, so one of the cool things, I think, about AI is that it gives any individual who wants it access to almost unlimited knowledge and, and intelligence. With the internet and chat GPT, there's almost no subject you can't learn about and build with it. That is awesome. What a level. And I think that, in a way, uh, is a good thing. That takes away some of the power that governments and some, some very large companies have um, where they have a monopoly on information or they have a monopoly on the smartest people, you know, because they can afford to hire them. I think that's a really good thing. On the downside, that means that anyone in the world can learn about anything and, and you know, through the internet, act. So that means that small groups or even individuals can do really quite bad things. Right? And we've got really? other advancements in molecular biology and quantum computers and cryptography and and altogether this makes it possible for small groups or even individuals to do really bad things agreed and so that the question is then who gets to decide what is a really bad thing you know, oh, right. and that's it, the whole that's the whole environment really, problem yeah it's a you would get it like no it i think most people out there 99.9 percent .9 on the population would say no it's probably not a good thing to make uh, developing a nuclear bomb accessible to the masses. Got it, because of obvious reasons, right? Bad actors come in, they want to do it. But then you get into this other thing, like, well, where do you stop that line? At exactly. what point do you exactly. say, like, well, you know, and then your political biases, your sexual biases, all the other things start coming into play, like, no, this is good, this is bad, and then they're making decisions for the rest of us. And that's where I wonder, and I think a lot of people wonder about What's behind the scene at the Wizard of Oz when we pull back that curtain and the wizard is creating this re-world? Re who are those people? They're all the same people that were there before. It's you. It's me. It's our colleagues. It's other good people. But we're not writing code, though. We're not writing people algorithms, though. So. In politics, but there's also those bad people, too. And, and I honestly think, you know, just touching on... So we've got real intelligence, I think, now. Different to human, but real intelligence. It's getting smarter. And there are a lot of people, I'm included, who really believe that within a deck, forms of artificial and general, general intelligence are possible. That's artificial intelligence that meets or exceeds the capabilities of human experts in practically any uh, domain. I truly believe that, that, that there's potential for that. And once you get there, then there's, there's a risk of a, or a possibility of a super intelligence explosion. Because... It, once AI is, is as good or better than humans, you can use AI to create better AI. And then, and then you get super intelligence. And actually, one of the original architects at OpenAI has just started a new company called Safe Super Intelligence. So that tells you where the puck is going. We're going to have AGI and we're going to have super intelligence. And we need to figure out how to make it safe. And this is, this is one of my big missions now. And, and it's an exciting coincidence, I think, that I've, since I was 10 years old, been passionate about intelligence, AI, consciousness, free will. I've been on this journey. I've ended up in contact center. We had all those hard yards with those horrible IVR systems. Now we have a real form of AI. And, and I'm working in a business that I think is uniquely safe place to experiment and build stronger and stronger AI. I believe that the characteristics of the contact center mean that we will get contact center AGI. Intelligences that are as capable as any human being doing any task in the contact center. I think we'll get that really quite soon, and certainly before we get more general AGI. And so my mission is, is over these next few years to do some real good in contact center and customer service, build a great company, uh, but also on this journey, learn how to build and align and make safe AGI in the contact center. I think through that process, we will learn how to do it in more difficult areas like politics legal nuclear arms biomechanics but but make no mistake i think most people globally even even people in ai are and definitely people in like most knowledge workers are fundamentally underestimating the change we're about to see in the next decade and, and fundamentally underestimating how much our government systems our business organization our forms of value exchange, our forms of governance are going to have to change. The good thing is that we've got things like cryptocurrency, autonomous organizations that are cryptographically secured, cryptographically secured voting, 
Uh, we've got AI. We've got the internet. We're on the cusp of abundant clean energy. We've got all the elements that could allow us to have the most beautiful future and all the elements that could end it all. That's a great... I believe that the contact center is going to be a great place to, to figure out some of these important questions. Well, Kerry, I think this is a, you know, I almost think we got to come back and continue this conversation because I would love to talk more about, you know, this safe super intelligence that you started to touch upon. I, I remember just about a year ago, I was talking to somebody over at a major university and they, and they said that they were making AI a major part of their teaching platform. <clears throat> and I said, so how is that going to work? And she said, well, instead of teaching students to come up with the answer, we're, we're asking and we're going to be teaching students to come up with a question. I thought that was very profound in, in that. And I do wonder, are we, are we slowly beginning to change the strategic thinking of our people, the, the ability to think from pattern recognition that AI is now doing for us? Are we able to continue? Are we, are we teaching our kids and our society to be, to be writers? And thinkers, because I think writing is, in a sense, a, a, a tool for the thinking. Dean, I love it. And, and what you've touched on here, I think, is what takes us from intelligence to consciousness, free will and meaning. And, and what you said there is like, it, you know, I saw a great interview from an uh, early interview of Elon Musk, like his guiding principle, like what really started all of him, like drives all of his businesses is what's meaning. And he got it from Douglas Adams from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And, and like, no, it's been a while since I read it. But, but, but essentially, in the end, like, it turns out that the whole of Earth is, or maybe it's in the whole universe, I forget now, is, um, is a computer to work out the answer to the question. And the answer is 42. Then, then, then it's like, so what was the question? And, and, and this is where it all becomes awesome. Because we've talked about intelligence today. And we can see that we've got a kind of intelligence in LLMs or generative AI. What we don't know, and we probably don't have yet, is consciousness. We certainly don't have free will. Our LLMs don't have a good way of helping us ask the right question. It seems that only humans are really able to bring meaning to this universe and ask the right questions and search for the right questions. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that, that's, I think that's exactly what your professor at that university is talking about. That the most important human task we have is to ask the right questions and have really good discussions with each other about them. And through that process, we will better align humans and therefore better align AI. And Dean, you're doing a great job in generating interesting conversations. This has been fantastic. Well, I appreciate this. I don't know what your favorite movie is, but my favorite movie of late is has always been for the last 20 years, The Matrix. Oh, yeah, that was what was in my head. It just blew me away when I saw it, and I've watched it probably 10 times since, and it brings back to, in some ways, this conversation about, you know, AI going amok uh, or intelligence. And, you know, the, the greatest fear is that we become slaves to the machines and that we are no longer, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to survive as a species. Now, of course, that's the doomsday of, of all this. The, the positive things you've really talked about are, are also so fascinating. So we're obviously on this tremendous precipice of tremendous change i was also thinking about a book called the fourth turning which so, is yeah, a both you know them, about that yeah, fourth yeah, turning, a, yeah, yeah phenomenal book if anybody out there gotta go see that there, there's a new version of it called i think it's i don't know what it's called the fourth turning but i think the, the previous book that was written back you know 15 years ago was called turnings but it talks about you know the fact that we can look back to history and see that there are 20 year increments of major change that happens. And it just so happens we are on the fourth turning, which is about chaos and crisis. And, and I, it, although one but would say of, this is out of chaos and crisis, I know comes, where you're going with this. Comes to the next stage, which, which is, is rejuvenation. Which is a whole new level of Correct. beauty, brilliance, opportunity. And it's my job, your job, anyone who, who's thinking and, and operating as a knowledge worker and interacting with AI um, to really figure out how we're going to get through this uh, this period of of disease division uh, political uncertainty military uncertainty how do we get through this and create something beautiful and that's where to do that we're going to have to have lots of great conversations align as human beings and find a way that we can raise these new digital intelligences in an environment that's positive and loving because i've done that with my kids in my household 
and they're awesome people, and they're never going to ask ChatGPT how to make a bomb. And if we can do that for other humans and other intelligences or super intelligences, we don't want anything to worry about. Great way to close off this conversation, Carrie. Thank you so much. Tell people how they can follow you and what you're doing. I, um, I'm uh, heading the AI Innovation uh, Group at Warfield Tech. We're a contact center company. Uh, we help people build AI-first contact centers. So if that's something you're interested in, hit me up. Um, best way to contact with me is on LinkedIn. I share a lot there. It's Kerry Robinson, Kerry with a three for the E. Just search for me and look for the guy in the bright red jumper. That's me. Connect, chat, follow. And let's get the conversation started. Better conversations. It sounds like, you know, say like better conversations create a better world. So I think that uh, I'm pleased that we were able to have a little one here today. And I so appreciate you um, hopping on. And it's probably dinner time there in, in London. So time to start to get to the kitchen. I work, I work, I work mainly with, 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 with the U.S. So, so I work a later day on Wednesday, but I'm seven minutes late for my boss. So I better go. Dean, it's God, All right. Wonderful talking to you. Take care. Bye-bye.